Welcome back to the Checking From Behind episode. I'm Zach, joined with Preston. First off, how are you doing today? Uh, doing pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm glad we got some stuff to talk about this week. Um, been actually a pretty eventful week, I'd say, in, yeah. in the hockey world. For it being in the middle of, like, pretty much the end of July. So, you know, just got to make it through one more month of... of Pretty pretty dry news. I kind of feel bad for Oilers fans because <laughs> it's they, the final. they got Stan Bowman as their GM now, though. He's made some horrible trades, horrible signings. He's done some horrible things I'm not going to speak of. Like, Yeah, I mean, I feel like mo- if, if you're watching this podcast, you probably know what he did. Um, long story short, he covered up uh, some serious allegations. Uh Got outed years ago. Got fired and de- got kicked out of the NHL indefinitely. He was reinstated, but I didn't think anyone was going to hire him because a I don't think he was that great of a GM to begin with, and b after what he did, I don't think he deserved another chance. The Oilers thought I guess they just wanted a, a veteran GM. You know, he did win three Stanley Cups with the Blackhawks, but he, he did make some decent trades. But a lot of that team was already built by Dale Talon before he got there. Including you know all the hard stuff, Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, um, a bunch of their court, Brent Seabrook, Duncan Keith, Corey mm-hmm. Crawford. Those, those guys were there when Bowman got there. Um, I th- he left Chicago on a really bad note. Outside of you know what he got fired for, he was making very poor decisions, bad trades, bad contracts, which kind of cascaded and accelerated chicago into being a bottom feeder in the league i think they're on their way out of being a bottom f- feeder now but he definitely accelerated that process and i think they had a couple more years where they could possibly contend but due to some of his short-sighted moves i think it kind of closed their window a little too soon yeah he i get he wanted to tear down the team but there's a methodical way that you can tear down a team like i'm not no nhl gm i'm sitting here on a couch like I, I don't fucking know shit compared to him. I mean, he's pretty fire in NHL twenty four though. I mean he <laughs> he could take the he can take the blue jackets, get him the cup in year one. Oh, uh, I fucking wish. So yeah, he in 2017, 2016, 2017 range it looked like he wanted to tear the team down and start from scratch. Well, he did a horrible job of it. He traded Panarin for nothing. Well, um, I mean, he traded him for Brandon Saad, which Brandon Saad's not it, a bad it, player. It looked good at the time. So, so we're going to highlight one of these trades specifically is probably one of the things that he would want to have back. So on June 23rd, 2017, the Blackhawks traded Artemi Panarin, Tyler Mott, and a 2017 sixth round pick to the Columbus Blue Jackets in exchange for Brandon Saad, which they had traded to Columbus a few years prior. Uh, Anton Forsberg and a 2018 fifth round pick. I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea who those draft picks amounted to. Probably nothing, but you never know. But Chicago gave up the best player in this deal. And, you know, Brandon Saad is not a bad player by any means. You know, he won two Stanley Cups. You know, he was a core member of that Blackhawks team for when they won those Cups. But you give up a guy, Panarin, who's at that point was a star in the making. You know, he had really great chemistry with Patrick Kane. From I remember at the time reading things, it was more for contract-related reasons. They weren't sure if Panarin was going to sign a long-term contract with the Blackhawks. And they'd rather have the security of having Brandon Saad under contract for longer and having that control over risking losing Panarin for nothing in two years, which I think is dumb. Because when you have Panarin, he has great, great, great chemistry. When he played with Patrick Kane, they were incredible together. You know, he helped Patrick Kane tremendously. Um you know, they traded the way to Columbus. You know, he, he becomes even better in Columbus without Patrick Kane, which everyone was a little bit surprised. I remember big narratives at the time was, can Panarin be good without Kane? Like, without a top-line Hall of Fame player on the wing on the, on the wing with him. And he did. He was he was still great in Columbus. Um, and then the, the other really, I think this might be one of the worst trades, period, that, he, that I've seen in a long time, was uh, the <laughs> Seth Jones trade. So this was one of his last trades he made before he got fired, July 23rd, 2021. Uh, This is another trade with the Blue Jackets. So 
Chicago got Seth Jones, a 2021 first round pick, which ended up being the 32nd pick in the draft. It was the pick Columbus got from Tampa Bay because Tampa Bay had won the cup that year and a 2022 sixth round pick. Going back to Columbus, Adam Boquist, who at the time was a very highly touted defensive prospect, didn't work out in Columbus. But, uh, you know, for the time, he was a very highly touted defenseman. 2021 first round pick, which I believe ended up being the 12th pick and ended up being Cole Sillinger, was a pretty solid pick. A 2021 second round pick. Don't I'll be honest, I don't know at the top of my who that is. And then the 2022 first round pick, which ended up being the sixth overall pick, which ended up being uh, Dave, David or Adam Jiracek? David. David Jiracek, sixth overall. So Columbus gets Cole Sillinger, who's regular nhl or now at this point david jiracek who's still he's still developing but he still has the potential to be a top four defenseman you know bowquist didn't work out but you trade south jones who was obviously in decline at the time and then columbia then chicago gives him a gigantic contract now mind you i do think he was a bit better for them last year i mean it was hard to be worse than the rest of the team because that the whole team was bad especially the defensive core but at the end of the day that's just way too much to give up for aging player in seth jones but columbus really didn't have any leverage in a trade for at the time either because seth jones like say hey guys going to the last year of his contract i'm not going to resign here please trade me and you know teams could have said you know we're just going to wait till he's a ufa i guess chicago didn't want to (laughs) wait and they give up gave up one of their best if not the best prospect at the time and adam boquist yeah who personally i think now there's all what ifs because adam boquist isn't working out which Columbus buys him out just this past offseason now he's on Florida but what if Bo Quest works out with um Chicago and now he's here with Connor Bedard and Korchinski and the rest of the boys I mean that's not guaranteed I mean I guess course. from Chicago's perspective you you know what you're getting mm-hmm. Seth Jones you know he was great in Columbus for a long time. His last couple of years in Columbus, he started to you know trend down a little bit. I think he had a, he blocked a lot of minutes for them. You know, he was their number one defenseman, but you know Seth Jones still has the the chance to rebound. But still, you give up two a, a, the twelfth overall pick and it would end up being the sixth overall pick and a second round pick. That's a lot to give up. It's a lot, a lot. Yeah. So you know, then obviously all that stuff happens where he ends up getting fired and. Edmonton, it just doesn't make sense to me either because I thought the GM who was filling in for Ken Holland, I thought he was doing a great job. He was. Um, I think he fleeced the Sabres for uh, McLeod. You know, they got a top prospect in Massavoy. I thought he made some really smart signings for the agency. I really like them bringing in Jeff Skinner. Um, And now if you bring in a guy with a horrible reputation, you know, the fans are rightfully angry. You know, they were one win away from winning the Stanley Cup next year. Now it feels... At least to a lot of the fans, like they might have took a step back, at least in the front office. I <clears throat> kind of agree with that because I'm not a fan of Stan Bowman, not a fan of the Oilers hiring him. Personally, I'm going to look up to see who it was because it's actually really bothering me now to see who was filling in for the Oilers because the moves he was making... They were smart. They were smart, calculated moves, and they were he was putting the Oilers in a position to win. So I finally found it. <laughs> After like five minutes, Jeff Jackson was filling in. He's the CEO and president of Hockey Ops. So he was making those moves. And then they're like, you know what? We eventually need to find a GM and they get Stan Bowman. Yeah, I mean, they did need a GM. Leon Dreisaitl is reportedly close to an extension per Bob Stauffer. Uh, he had a radio show in Edmonton. And that kind of had me wondering what an extension could look like. Long-term deal. McDavid, Bouchard, and Dreisaitl all reportedly are expected to take team-friendly deals. Really? Now, wow. Yeah. Now, team-friendly deals, we're not talking about McDavid taking fucking $12 million, okay? Sorry for my language. We're talking about is probably going to take around Matthews maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I don't know. McDavid, the same thing, and Bouchard, we'll see. So back to Dreisaitl. Like, Dreisaitl, I can see taking a seven- to eight-year deal possibly for $13.5, $14 million, I think, is what he's worth. I mean, this dude can put a team on his back when he can. I mean, he did it in the, the Stanley like a final. I mean, he, he was pretty bad. He was also playing on, like, one limb, though. Okay. McDavid was too. <laughs> yeah, but McDavid was putting the team on his back. You know what that <laughs> but Drysaddle had one good game in the Stanley you know, Cup final. So are we not giving Drysaddle a pass then for being hurt? If you're playing, you have to perform. Is that what we're saying then? Because I'll accept that. If you're playing, you I have think, to perform. You know, 
I hate to be that guy who says just to suck it up and play, but like <laughs> you're one of the premier players in the league. You won an MVP. You're one of the highest paid players in the league. You got to step up. You know, I get you know you're playing with pain at that point in the playoffs. A lot of other players are as well. You yeah. Know? I, I understand. I play through injuries. It, it's debilitating. It, it, it can suck the energy out of you. But you know, you got you got to show up. And show up when it matters. So. I don't think Dry Settle showed up for most part in the Stanley Cup final. Now, I'm not saying he's not worth like big bucks. He totally is. Yeah. You know, a, a healthy early on Dry Settle probably is the difference maker in the Oilers winning the Stanley Cup last year. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Dreisaitl is going to give you 100-plus points consistently every single season. The Oilers, whatever he asks for, I think the Oilers should throw at him as long as they have I, I just want to know how they make the money work because, you know, you you got big big money thrown around because obviously McDavid's going to get probably 16, 17 mil. That mm-hmm. wouldn't shock me. You know, if it, I would say a team-friendly deal for McDavid's like 14 and a half. <laughs> I'm that, with you. That's like a team-friendly deal for McDavid. It's even fucking... You know, I Bouchard, I could see getting around eight and nine million dollars mm-hmm. a year. He needs to play a little bit more before he takes like he gets like big he's, boy money. He's young too. Yeah, I mean he's coming off his ELC, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you also yeah, Dry Saddle's worth. Pro- I think it's a team friendly deal for him is like around twelve, thirteen million, maybe fourteen. Um, you know, because you know you have two of the best players in the world on your team, and then, but you know, they have some other bad contracts on the team, specifically Darnell Nurse, that's going to hold them back a little bit. Yeah, that's that's the one thing that I'm really concerned about because I know we went over a little bit in a recent episode where the Oilers, like, their bottom of their roster, they're not making a ton of money. It's like between one to three million dollars. You have Zach Hyman make, making five, but then you look at Darnell Nurse and it's like he's making nine and a half. That is going to be the one problem they're going to have is you can't get rid of that contract at all. It's it's going to be on your salary cap. It's going to stay on your team. So my question, like you said, is. How are they going to maneuver around that $9.5 million? And more contract extensions going around. Travis Konechny did sign one with the Philadelphia Flyers, an eight-year by $8.75 million a year contract. Uh, personally, I think that's a little bit of an overpay. I thought 8.75 was too much. I was maybe around 7 I would have been happy with. Do I think Travis Konechny still... Has a lot more left in the tank, of course. He's only 27. I know, but 8.75 for Konechny is a lot. And I, I mean, know he had 68 be, points on a, the Flyers team that couldn't score well, last year. Se- like 67 points, like I'll give you seven, seven and a half. Yeah, but he, uh, he's uh, he's been on that team for his whole career. I mean, I'm of the philosophy that with the salary going cap going up the way it's going up, an eight to nine million dollar contract in three years is going to be like a six seven million dollar contract. I think you know players are going to start getting paid more, even players that aren't like back in the day. I remember if you were an eight plus, you were like an elite player. Mm-hmm. If you were like ten, you were like top five in your position. That's changing. A lot of players are starting to get paid a lot more than eight million dollars. You know, more average players. That that's just players are going to start getting paid more money. You know, I think in two or three years. We're, this contract's not going to be. We're not even going to be a debate if he's worth that because it you might know, look like a steal. Yeah, oh, wait, wait till like wait till the salary cap gets over like a hundred million dollars. Like, it's players are going to start getting paid a lot more, which they deserve. You know, I think NHL players have been underpaid for a very long time, especially compared to other sports. But I mean, I personally don't have any problems with the connecting contract. I mean, <clears throat> you have a point where they are underpaid compared compared to a lot of sports because you look at the nba and nfl bench players the nba is the nba is the NBA, worst you can be a 10th man and be making more than Connor mcdavid austin matthews it's like they don't make, make that much <laughs> you know i'm being a little bit over dramatic they, ma- they make more than an average nhl yeah. player like they can make two or three million dollars just sitting on the bench the whole year i mean that's an easy two to three million i fucking wish man. i mean you I still got to be a really good basketball player to even sit on the bench in the <laughs> yeah, nba that's true <laughs> that's true because you know people I, I see these videos where people are like oh that dude's a scrub he just sits on the bench i can beat him and then they play him one-on-one and they get smoked dude you, you know what you go that did you see the one video of brian scalabrini yeah. going to a public gym so for you guys that don't know this is like a viral video so Brian Scalabrini was sick and tired of everybody calling him a scrub, so he went to a public gym and had it filmed, and anybody that wanted to do a 1v1, he went, he smoked every single buddy. That made no (laughs) sense. Every single buddy. Everybody in that gym. The average professional, the worst professional sports player on the worst team is better than your average ass sitting at your 9-to-5 right now. (laughs) 
I am, damn. They are better than me. Okay. You know, I, I like to think our viewers are very skilled people, and they could probably <laughs> take Connor McDavid on a one-on-one. Oh, uh, all right. Listen, Nate, I love you, but he thinks my brother thinks that he can score one out of a hundred shots on Vasilevsky. Where has he ever told you that? I mean, I've never even t- seen him take a shot with the puck go in the air. <laughs> so, I think yeah, the puck weighs more he, than him. He tells Chris all the time that if he had point blank 10 foot shots in front of Vasilevsky, he's going to score one out of 100 times. Just no. one. He's like, just one ass. I think the only way he'd have a chance is if Vasilevsky got tired. <laughs> Uh yeah, you know what? Yeah, I I don't people don't realize how hard it is to compete against a player. Like my delusional ass thinks I can go be a single A baseball player for an MLB organization. Guess what? I can't. I can't. Okay? So I'm calling everybody out. I don't right even now. know I don't even know how we got to talk no, about I this. Don't but, know. You know, we'll get it back on track here. Uh yeah, I have no problem with the connecting contract. Another uh big contract signing this week is uh Sabres with Ukapeka Lukanen. He signs a five-year contract with an AAV of $4.75 million. I love this contract. I love this contract, too. 4.75, great contract. He performed well from December all the way to end the season. Was one of the reasons why the Sabres were in a ton of games towards the end of the season. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially for the Sabres, if he can keep this going, you know, for the next couple of years, it like prove that like that span wasn't just a, wasn't a fluke. Mm-hmm. You know, you're paying less than $5 million for your starting goalie for five years. And then you have Devin Levi, who's also developing, who you can have a 1A, 1B tandem for at least five years. All right. I'm going to pose this question because I posed it on literally all my social media, okay? I'm not disrespecting the tandem I'm going to bring up right now because it was the best tandem in the league for since 2019, 2020, 2021. I don't even know, okay? Is Devin Levi and Uko Pekalukinen going to be a swayman all mark situation? No. Can it? You don't it think ca- it can be. be? It can be. But I, you know, I need Levi to have a full season in the NHL, and I need Luke Lukanen to have a full season of consistency before we can even talk about that being a thing. The same breath of air. I mean, you know, Swayman and Allmark, you were two elite goaltenders playing at the top of their game at the same time. You know, Lukanen and and Levi are both still pretty young. I mean, Lukanen is twenty five. I think Levi's twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. So you still. A lot of room to grow. You know, could they be there one day? Absolutely. You know, I think Levi has the potential to be, you know, a number one goalie in the league. I think Lukanen proved he can be a number one goalie in the league as well. And if they could both, like, play at the top of their game together, yeah, I, I could totally see that happening. I mean, yeah. The... It took a lot. It took a lot longer than what I expected it to, and it r- originally was going to go to arbitration, but they finally got a deal done. I'm glad I, I don't like arbitration. No, <laughs> and the reason that I thought it was like going to go until arbitration is because Devin, they had Devin Levi coming up in the system, and I was like, you know what? Maybe they only want Levi here for two or three years, and Levi wants to stay long term. Maybe Levi was asking for a seven year contract, and they met in the middle. Oh. Um, Levi. No, it's not not Levi. Excuse me, UPL. My I was bad. About to say, no. <laughs> Levi, he, like he's a he's a he's on his rookie contract. He's on his still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I misspoke. Um, I mean that could have been thing too. I'm just speculating stuff right now. But I'm glad they got a deal done. I'm glad it's for five four point seven five because I thought he was gonna get five and a half. For those of you not familiar with the concept of arbitration, let me just explain it to you real quick and why I think it's real bad. Okay. Uh, uh, so pretty much, let's say I'm the GM and Zach's a player on my team. I tell Zach, I want to pay you $4 million a year for four years. And Zach says, you know what? I'm worth $6 million, and I want a five-year contract. And we cannot agree. So we literally go to a judge, and we both make our cases. So I'm literally telling Zach why he's not worth what he thinks he's worth. And then Zach tells me tells the judge why he thinks he's worth more than what I'm saying, and then the judge has to make a decision. And based usually it's somewhere in the middle, but most of the time after those kinds of hearings, that relationship is fractured, and usually the player ends up leaving. The one thing that I that's, this is completely off topic, but I play on be the show, and every time you take a player to arbitration, they always go at the player's side. I fucking hate it. Anyways, um, yeah, I I'm glad arbitration wasn't needed with this because if it got the arbitration like you said relationship could be a little bit fractured by then and it's like well upl could be saying you don't want me like it's like you think i'm worth like that much like look at my numbers like exactly. he's like yeah but you know 
we got to see more of it, man. Dude, was he like, could have, he could have, Kevin Adams could have been up there and be like, listen, we got to see more consistency and we have Devin Levi coming up. Like, if, if the words come out, we have Devin Levi coming oh, up. Oh, I wouldn't sign. I was like, I would fuck be you, like, trade me. <laughs> That's what I would yeah. do. No, I'm glad I got a ton. Yes. Yes. I, I think while we're, we're talking about arbitration RFAs, I think, I know it's a little down on the list, but let's, I think we should talk about the RFAs now. So there are still, still some pretty big name RFAs that have not been signed. I believe only one of them on this list is filed for arbitration, but uh, Seth Jarvis, I don't believe he's eligible for arbitration. I don't think so. I think the holdup on him is I think they're waiting to see what happens with Natchez because I can't imagine Natchez gets a long-term deal. They can't deal. afford both of them either. So I think they're probably I, – I think Natchez, he's the one player on this list that we have that did file for arbitration. I think that will go to arbitration. That will probably end up being a one- or two-year deal. And it will block him to UFA, and that will be that. And then after that gets done, then they can figure out what they're going to do with Seth Jarvis because I'm assuming they want him on a long-term deal. It's probably going to be a lot of money, and they need to figure out. They're, they're kind of cap crunched right now, and they need to figure out what's going on with Natchez before they sign Jarvis. There's no rush to get Jarvis done. He's not going to get offer sheeted, and if they do, they'll probably branch it, unless it's something absurd. But I don't think a team's going to offer sheet Seth no. Jarvis. I, they would have happened by now. But uh, I think Natchez is the main holdup in Seth Jarvis, if you want to go into our next couple players. Yeah, I wonder what's going on with Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond. What... <clears throat> What I want them to do is get almost identical contracts. I think that's what Eiserman should do. I have heard absolutely nada about Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond. I've heard something about every single other player. I don't know if Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond is just a cap thing, which I don't think it is. I think Detroit has way more than enough cap to get both of them on long-term deals for yeah. seven, eight million dollars. I mean, I think you're, you're you're trying to figure out what the right money is because I thought Raymond had an awesome season for the Red Wings last Much year. Much of a bounce back, and, and I thought Sider had a bit of a down year last year compared to his first couple two years in the league. Um, you know, I, I no doubt they're going to get this done. I would expect them both to be long-term deals. I think there might be more of a, a holdup in Cider than Raymond because, you know, Cider did have that down year. But you look at that Detroit blue, like that blue line core, and it's not the strongest, and they need Cider real bad. I and mean, they need him to be that number one defenseman they, want, they, need him, they, they wanted him to be. They got to get both of them eight years, seven million dollars. I would, or eight by eight. I think eight by eight would be acceptable too. I think that'd be fair for both of them. Yeah. I mean, like pay, pay just off of their potential. Raymond, much of a bounce back season, and I think what was his third season or was his fourth? This is Raymond's third season. Okay. Yeah. All right. he, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you have to play three years to get yeah. out of your ALC. And Jeremy Swayman didn't get the arbitration, thankfully. I'm assuming he's asking for more money than what the Bruins want to give him. I mean, I'm, do you not think he's going to get eight nine million dollars a think year? He should get eight to nine million dollars a I year. Mean, he might get ten million. I, I think ten million outside of elite elite goaltenders. Do you don't think he's elite? I, I, I've, Bruins fans already came at me in the comments. Jesus Christ. Um, okay, I ha- I've stated this on the podcast a million times. I think Swayman's top five goalie in the league, arguably, but. The only thing that I need to see, though, is first full... Now, I get last season, took over Allmark's starting job completely. He played well in the playoffs. He played well. He played outstanding in the playoffs. Yes, he was very... He's elite. literally the reason why they beat the Toronto Maple Leafs Correct. in the first round. Correct. So, $10 million is too much for a goaltender in general. I know the cap is going up. It's going to be up over $100 million in three, four seasons, whatever it is. Long term, give him an eight year contract. A nine million dollars, I'll go to. I'll go to nine million dollars. I think if it was that easy, they'd have the contract signed already. I wonder if Don Sweeney is downplaying and trying to only be listen four years, six million dollars. Well, I think the fact that he didn't file for arbitration is a good thing. Yes, it's a so, means they're kind of close. yeah. That, that means they're probably having good talks, mm-hmm. and I'm sure Boston knows that he's going to get a lot of money. You know, especially after they traded Allmark. And all, and I think Swayman is like, look, you guys traded Allmark away. You need me. Mm-hmm. Pay me ten million dollars a year. Give him some leverage. It did give him leverage. You know, I mean, I don't think Boston's worried about getting him signed though either, because if they were, they wouldn't have traded Allmark away. I mean, yeah, Swayman, twenty five years old. I'm assuming going to be looking for a long term deal. Yeah, I would expect six to eight years. 
I'm honestly like this is the one player I'm intrigued to see what his contract is. Like all the other guys, kind of predictable, but I feel like Swayman could be a range of literally anywhere. I mean, I I, I think you were going to say earlier you wanted to. I, I I think this was the point you were going to okay. try to say is that Boston wants to see how he does a full year as like the bona fide like starter. Like the full on like one like you're just. The problem is you can't do that. You can't give him a one year contract. Of course, you can't give him a one year contract because like let's say you somehow get him to agree to take a one year contract. Contract, and he plays out uh, plays outstanding. Like he's the you're, best. You're in the giving finalist. him eleven million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> like you can't you can't afford to take that risk. You're yeah. better off just giving him the money in the term now, and just not worry about it for seven eight years. That could be a lot of things that Swayman could say too. Like you and Chris have stated six million times, and you, we've stated six million times on this episode alone. Like Swayman sits in there with his agent. All right, cap is projected to go up over ten million dollars in the next three to four seasons. We want an extra two million dollars that you're offering us. That that would be bold. That would be bold. Like, well, Don Sweeney could be offering him eight to nine right now, and he could be saying, "Listen, we want ten to 11. Uh, I think they'd have to compromise then, because meet in the mid- be, and also, I know this is going to be going off topic. Whatever Jeremy Swayman gets, okay, Igor Shosturkin has one year left. Shosturkin Jeremy, will get more. If Jeremy Swayman gets $10 million, Igor is getting 13 He's getting 12 to 13 I think Igor Shosturkin next year, after his last year of his contract, he will be the highest paid goalie in the I league. I agree. I promise you, man. Igor Shosturkin is going to win the Vezina Trophy on a contract year. This dude might... I don't even know how much. I'm going to look it up. The most money a goaltender has ever made. No, he's good. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. He's probably going to get the most of all time. I think, yeah. I think, he, I think he's going to. Uh, yeah, I think after next year, he will mm. be the highest paid goalie in NHL history. I think the highest paid goalie right now is was it, it's either so, Bobrovsky okay. or Vasilevsky, it's right? It's Bobrovsky at $10 million. Vasilevsky's at 9.5. The highest paid goaltender of all time, Carey Price, yeah. $10.5 million. Oh, Shosturkin's going to get more than that. Gonna He'll get at least 11. That. He'll get at least 11. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God! I'm. <clears throat> there, are, there are some players, like some positions, some players that you don't fuck around with contract talks. You just give them what they want, and you know, Vezina caliber goalie. You just, how he much do you want? Do you give him a blank check and say, just write how much you want? You want thirteen million? All right, we're giving you thirteen. I think million. there's a limit. Obviously, I think fourteen million is probably the limit. I could see him getting like twelve to thirteen, though. Twelve to thirteen is reasonable. Anything above thirteen, I'm like, dude, you're crazy, man. You are crazy. You will ride with Jonathan Quick until he's in a casket, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the last player we have on our list, though, is Matty Beniers from the Seattle Kraken. And this one uh, is kind of interesting to me, you know, because I thought Beniers also did have a bit of a down year after his uh, technically his rookie year yeah. on the Kraken because he, he was kind of in a situation like Owen Power where uh, kind of didn't really – like his first year of his ELC, he only played about 15, 20 games. So you didn't, really, you didn't really get a full season of, you know, what was going on. And then... Oh, actually, uh, yeah, in 21-22, he played 10. The next season, he played 80. He had a whole... Yeah, he only had 37 points this year. Mm-hmm. In yeah. 77 games. So I think if, you know, he had 57 his rookie year, right? Yeah. He won rookie of the year. You know, had a very promising start. Last year takes a step back. I mean, Seattle, I think, as a whole had issues scoring, not just him. But I think, you know, if he would have had like 60, 70 points last year, it's an easy eight-year contract extension. And it now I, I, I think he's going to get a bridge deal. I think he's going to get a three-, four-year deal. Kind of allow him. Don't put too much pressure on him. Allow him to bounce back, you know, and figure stuff out. And then three years down the road, he's still an RFA. Figure it out from there. I think that's smart for both parties, too, because, listen, okay, you're Seattle. This kid breaks out. You might have to pay him in three years when it's up, but guess what? You He's yours. About, yeah. Right. You're not walking him right into a UFA. And listen, Matty Beneers, if you perform during that bridge deal, guess what? You're getting a bag. You're going to get even more money than what you get now if you put up 60-something points. I'd, I'd say like a fair contract. It was like a three-year contract, five or six million dollars a year. Dude, if you're Seattle, you take that all. If you're both parties, you take that all day. I don't know. I think money is probably the bigger thing right now. I, I think I would imagine if I was in Matty Bernier's shoes, I'd understand long term contracts probably not on the table right now. Two, three year deals probably best case scenario for you. I'd say probably low range four million dollars, high range probably five and a half. I wouldn't be shocked though if when they agree to a contract, I see a eight year deal on the table. I really wouldn't be shocked. Even though he had a down season, well, I think it's Seattle. If, if Seattle wants him to sign an eight-year deal, I think what they're doing is we'll give you an eight-year deal, like six million a, a year, and that he's going to hold up. And well, I wouldn't take that if I'm no, near because you know he's still he's still super young. 
It's like 21, 22. I think 22. Can you see the 22 or 23? Yeah. Um, so it, it's an interesting case. Um, I wouldn't worry. About, the only player I would probably a little – that should really be of note is probably Natchez because – I, that's definitely going to arbitration. I don't think Carolina really intends on him being there much longer. I mean, they are actively shopping him mm-hmm. in this off like it, off season. It wasn't a secret. I don't think he wants to be there long term. They'll probably just have a one year deal and bye bye. All right, so I want to. We're gonna move on here. I want you to react to my top ten center list that I made earlier this week, and we're doing a four. We're doing a five week period of doing top. Top tens of each position. Okay. So honorable mentions: Elias Pedersen, J.T. Miller, Connor Bedard. All right. Starting here, at number ten: Sebastian Ajo. Nine: Jack Eichel. Eight: Braden Point. Seven: Jack Hughes. Six: Alexander Barkov. Five: Sidney Crosby. Four: Leon Draisaitl. Three: Austin Matthews. Two: Nathan McKinnon. And one, of course, Connor McDavid. I mean, there's no really debating. I think the top three there. You could probably switch. I would probably switch Matthews and McKinnon if I'm. Okay. Being honest, because just because Matthew can score so much, um, I mean Connor McDavid is an obvious number one. Uh, shout out to the old guy Sidney Crosby for still sticking around on this list. Uh, I mean, I I don't hate this list. I th- I, I I think the honorable mentions are good too. I don't know if Bedard deserves That's to be in I that conversation yet. You know, he he had a good great, great rookie year. Need to see more from him though. But you know. I think this is a pretty non-debatable list. I think for the most part in hockey, I mean, maybe as you get towards the bottom with like Eichel and Aho, maybe even Braden Point, you can make some arguments for other players. Hey, we're not taking Braden Point slander right now. Okay. No, he's a great player. Yeah. I'm not discounting that. Okay. 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 Just I I don't know if you're saying like he shouldn't be on the list. Like. No. Maybe no. I took it wrong. So. No, I mean. This stuff's. I think the top five is pretty rock solid. Yeah. I I might even consider taking Dry out of the top five and pushing Crosby and Barkov up one. That's. I was going between Dry Crosby, Barkov, and Jack Hughes because. Barkov, I think Jack Hughes at seven is good. That's what I was thinking, kind of, because I was like Jack Hughes. If you go off of his potential, sure, top five. But I was like. For going into this season, I was like, Barkov just put up a hell of a season and playoffs. Crosby put up 90-plus points at the age of 45 million years old. <laughs> Leon Dreisaitl was going to do his things, but I was like, I think really anywhere from you can flip-flop Nathan McKinnon, Matthews, however you want, and then between Dreisaitl to Jack Hughes, which we have on the list, it's going to be up on the screen for you guys for a visual. It's, I think it's pretty whatever you prefer. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a bad list. The only thing, though, is that... I'm kind of iffy on Aho being on number ten. I was going between Pedersen and Aho at number ten, and I was like, I would probably put Pedersen. I I'm not gonna lie. I had Pedersen there originally. I had Aho where Pedersen is on the honorable mentions, and last second I flipped it. Yeah, but I mean, I'm trying to think of other really great centers in the league that might deserve to to be on this list. You're just off the top of my head. And by the way, for anybody that's probably already in the comments already said, where's Sam Reinhardt put a 50 goals right winger? Uh, I know he's, list- he's listed as a right winger and center. I threw him at right wing, by the way. <laughs> I so. just, the way he said that. Is, like, <laughs> yeah, right winger. <laughs> no, that was good. Uh, but, yeah, let me know in the comments section. How do you guys like the list? Do you guys hate it? Because I hate it, too. Don't worry. Uh, I'm probably getting flamed. Oh, why is uh, Sebastian Ajo in the top 10? I already know somebody already said that. Um, but yeah, I think the list is pretty. Sebastian rough, so. Ajo's a great two-way forward. I love him. I'm a huge. You know what? Ajo jersey's gonna be hung up soon. Don't yeah, worry. No, it's not. No, it won't be. No, I'm not. Okay, it will be the, the Chinese version of the <laughs> yes, Ajo jersey. It. Next, we have teams with the best future. Felt like it was kind of a fun idea to do, and I have five, not in any specific order: the Sharks, Canadians, Ducks, Sabers, and Red Wings. I did leave out the Blackhawks, which might be controversial to some of you guys, but I didn't feel like. Well, they I think had the you're best. missing a pretty obvious one, but I'll bring that Ooh. up. Um, I'll bring it up later. Okay, 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 okay. It's probably a team that I would never think of because obviously, um, but all these teams have something in common. Okay, they all have. Not only do I have young youth on the team, but they young also, youth, young youth. <laughs> they also have young. They have young talent on the team. They also have a lot of prospects a deep prospect pool that doesn't necessarily mean anything but uh yeah i mean i could definitely help you with the future but let's just get right into the list so sharks um i thought they had a really great draft i we talked about them a few weeks ago uh don't really have much more to say about the sharks um cup contender 
What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, you want to say that a little bit louder into the I'm mic? I'm not saying they're a cup contender out loud. We kind of just did. I know. <laughs> um, you know, Macklin Celebrini, Will Smith. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're still, I think there's still a couple dark years ahead, but I think they're definitely going in the right direction. And then the Canadians, I think, are doing a really awesome job building out that core. Mm-hmm. They've been doing a really great job drafting, signing contracts. You know, I think Montreal is building something special. I still think they still think they need a goaltender. It's the one thing they need. Yeah, but I think like if you give these guys a few more years, I think they're going to be one of the most electrifying teams in the league. I agree. And Anaheim. Listen, Anaheim, I'm huge on. I think they're top. I'm not. You're not huge on no. Anaheim's prospect pool at all. Really, I I don't I'm not high on the Ducks as an organization. I don't like them as an organization, but I think they have some really good players in their org. They've been bad for like four or five years now. That's okay. You in order to get good, you have to be bad. Unless you're the Buffalo Sabers, <laughs> and the Sabers prospect pool is loaded. Now I get they got rid of Savoy, but you bring in Hellenius. Hel- Dude, I cannot pronounce this dude's name to save my life. And it's Hellenius, like I yes. think. Yes, Consta. I'm just going to keep saying Consta. They have Coolidge. I can go on and on about the prospect. But how many of the pro- – real? Except my, my problem with when play, people say, like, oh, their prospect pool is loaded. None of it matters. Realistically, how many of these guys are going to actually make the team? Probably one out of every ten. Yeah, because, I mean, you could have a great prospects pool like the Sabres because they have, like, a bazillion first-round picks because they trade away all their good mm-hmm. players. But – you don't have room for all those young guys on a team. So, I mean, it's good. You could be good trade bait for other teams and yeah. get some, like, some p- players to round out your depth. Like, they traded away Savoy to get a third line center, which they really needed the third line center, but you give up, like, your, one of your best prospects for that. But, I mean, I hope the Sabres have a bright future. They've been saying that for 10 years. So, <laughs> and the Red Wings are last on this list. I think like on, it's more like on their roster that they have a lot of young talent, but they have, do some. They do have some prospects in their pool that I think could pan out to be really well of them. And one of them, Simon Edvinson, who is a defenseman who honestly could jump into the team this season, help Mo Sider out a ton. Because let's be honest, Mo Sider playing with Wallman, and I like Wallman, but he just wasn't up to the caliber of Sider and playing with Ben Sherrod and Jeff Petrie just wasn't helping him at all. I think Detroit still needs goaltending, but... Although, I do like Sebastian Cosa. Yeah, but I think he's still a couple years away. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with now, you. Now, not only get to the one team, I think you, you've you messed up not putting them on this team. I don't know, maybe you, if you were just thinking, like, teams that necessarily have been playoff contenders the last few years, but the New Jersey Devils, like, dude, look, look at their roster. They're all these super young players. This... They're all locked up on long-term deals. Like, look, look at their team. They're going to be great for 10 years. This hurts my heart because I think they're going to – I'm not going to spoil it. I think they're a Stanley Cup contender. That's all I'm going to say. And I think they might win multiple cups in the next Is 10 years. Is that not a bright future? You're, you know what? You're right. I, you're right. I <laughs> fucked up here. I fucked up. I was thinking pro- – I should have just labeled this teams with best prospect pools because I only went yeah. off – Because like – Neither the Devils have a good prospect pool too though. I mean that's true. I didn't, it didn't really come to mind. I'm – I, I mean, look at the, the look at like, yeah, look at their team and like look at all the young talent because if they we're have. Look, if we're talking about best futures too, like you can throw a team like Dallas on there because I think they're going to be good for a while. Ah, even I though mean, they have some age. Yeah, I, I think you should have renamed this the best prospect pools. You but know, fine list, fine. List, I get what you were going for. Yeah, I totally get what you were going for. So Honestly, I'm not going to give you too much. Not going to lie, I'm probably already getting flamed now. How do you feel about drafting a starting lineup of only players 30 years or older? It's up to you. Um, it's if you don't if you want to hold off on it, that's fine. Are we taking turns or just? Yeah, uh, we're just gonna we're gonna take turns. Oh, then can I have the first pick? Yes, sir. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pick Sidney Crosby I with my that. first pick. Okay, yo, he's my starting center, uh, arguably top five player of all time. Yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> and he's still top ten player in the league in my opinion. Um, I'm I'm gonna get back to that real quick before we end the episode because okay. I have an interesting comment that what he made on the Crosby video. Okay, okay so uh, right wing, I'm Nikita Kucherov. Okay, he's that, 31 years. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good pick. Um, hmm. If you if you want the list, I wrote down like two players for each. Yeah, I'll take a list. I Go don't. for it. Yeah, I'll, for defense, I'll take uh, Victor Hedman. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so at left wing, I'm going to take Artemi Panarin. Okay. He's over. Th- yeah, he is yeah, pretty old. He's 32. So are we just going off based on players now or like their whole career? Um, we'll do we'll do now. Okay. Goaltending, then I'm gonna pick a goalie right now. Oh, I forgot yeah. goaltender on here. Uh, I'm gonna pick. Uh, I'm gonna pick Bobrovsky. Okay. All right. I like that. Um, right D. Very underrated guy, actually. Jacob Slavin. He's that old already. Yeah. He's over thirty. I know. Okay, well, that makes my next pick easy. Uh, Roman Yossi. <laughs> so you, I still got to pick a couple wingers. but um, All right, so my center. I think your team is much better than mine because of defense and goaltending. I'm going with JT Miller here at center. Uh, I'm going to pick for uh, left wing, Steven Stamkos. So I have a right D, Dougie Hamilton. Okay. I mean left D, excuse me. And for my right wing, I'm going to pick Patrick Kane. I'm going to look at Benage real quick. Because Did you hear my pick though, Patty Kane. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think you, he's still good. You just smoked me. All right, because it's thirty and older, and not third over the age of thirty. Andre Velas- Vasilevsky. Andre yes, Andre Vasilevsky. <laughs> Andre Vasilevsky. You're my starting goaltender. So okay, let's just go over our starting teams real quick. So I have okay. my forward. I have Stamkos, Crosby, and Kane, <laughs> and then Hedman and Yossi and Bobrovsky. Let's hear yours. <laughs> Oh, I don't even want to say it. Holy shit. I prepared for this, and I just got fucking smoked. Um, <laughs> defense first, man. Defense first. <laughs> you know what? You're right. I'm a defense first guy and whatever. So my defenseman, I have Slavin and Hamilton. <laughs> my goaltender, Vasilevsky, respectable. Nikita Kucherov yeah. better put up six goals a game. <laughs> and then I have JT Miller and Panarin. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> so I, I went with the... The Hall of Fame team, and you went with uh, a couple good players and with mid. mid. I mean, Hamilton and Slavin are fine, but you, I, why, you, but you, Roman Yossi was still there. You know what? You know what? I'm dumb because I was going by handness. I wasn't going by overall Gives because I would have. I would have taken. I would have taken. Care, Hosey. man. You know what? That I don't care. Mindset helped you apparently. Um, you know, it was good. So everybody, flame me for preparing for this, and I still fucked it up. Congrats, to you Preston. You're one and zero. Um, all right, and now last thing I'm going to have you do, blind rank current head coaches. Okay, that should be interesting. This is an interest. I was going to do GMs because you brought it up last week after we recorded, but I was like, that's kind of... I think we can make a whole video out yeah, of that. Yeah, exactly. All right, so I have a list here, and I kind of wanted to mix it up. I didn't do all, all-time yeah. grades because, you know... It's just current G- yes, coaches, it's, right? It's blind ranking current NHL head coaches. All okay. right, number one, we have Bruce Cassidy. Two. Number two, Jared Bednar. Four. Jim Montgomery. Five. Mike Sullivan. Three. And Martin St. Louis. Uh, I guess he's number one. I thought you were going to add John Cooper into that list. I was going to add John Cooper, but I was like, that's kind of too easy. He's I, like the coaches that were obviously number one. I'm like, I'm not putting it on this time because that's what I always do. I always put an obvious number Marty one. Marty St. Louis is the best coach of all time. Come he's on. also the best player of all time. Heard it here first. Wayne Gretzky, who? I ain't never heard of him. Martin St. Louis. You know, Marty St. Louis, he is, he's my coach now. He's my coach now. He's the best coach in the NHL. He's one of the Jack items next year. Interesting. Okay, well, that's going to end it for today's episode. If you guys enjoyed all of our content, all of our socials are down below on YouTube. Subscribe, notification bell. And if you guys are on Spotify and Apple, head over to our YouTube, TikTok, Discord. Join it all, and we'll see you guys in our next episode.